small disclaimer, earlier a lot of this week, been fighting off congestion, so should sound better now, <laughs> my voice, but if it sounds different, that's why. Blame the weather and blame allergies. This book is full of spiders. 17 hours prior to the outbreak. Disclaimer. The following sequence of events was relayed by John, the author, after the fact, and no attempt was made to corroborate this version of events through witness interviews. While there is no evidence directly contradicting any of this account, much of it seems highly unlikely. John wound up needing five hours to find Frankie Burgess. That may sound impressive to you, considering there were rows of trained uniformed men fanning out across several square miles around the hospital all day Friday without success, but... It actually took longer than John was hoping. It wasn't until 8pm that he found himself face to face with Frankie across a pane of dirty glass, and he had been hoping to have the whole situation wrapped up while it was still daylight. Night is when bad things happen and undisclosed. Well, bad things also happen in the daytime, but at least you can see where you're going and when you're running away. Anyway, in early November, night falls at around 6, so after getting off the phone with Dave at the video store at 3, John had spent an hour driving around in his caddy and gained a sense of the situation around town. The manhunt, which seemed to involve several hundred police, volunteers, and National Guardsmen, appeared to be focused on the wooded area east of the hospital, and the empty houses and trailers around it. It made sense from their point of view, he supposed. They were looking for a spot where a deranged and wounded man would crawl off to die, but they weren't going to find Frankie. It wasn't going to be that easy. There were local cops who had to know better, who had to know that the situation at the hospital had been that other thing, the kind of business that pops up and undisclosed every few years when the town decides to start coloring outside the lines. John was picturing the chief trying to nudge the National Guard in that direction, maybe suggesting that they expand the surge, and that maybe additional precautions should be taken with the quarantine. Special hearing protection, perhaps. Or hazmat suits. And instead of just the hospital, maybe rope off the whole town. Or state. But then that would lead to a lot of awkward questions, and the chief would quickly back down and just pray that the whole thing would come to nothing, if only it ever worked out that way. John, on the other hand, was thinking monster from the start, since, you know, the situation was caused by a monster. It was just a matter of figuring out what kind of monster it was. There are really only two kinds of monsters in the world, which you already know if you've been watching horror movies. Breeders and non-breeders. So for instance, Frankenstein's monster would fall into the second category if he was real. He's a freak, a singular being, and once you kill him, he's gone. Problem solved. The breeders are an exponentially bigger problem. Within that group, you've got slow breeders like vampires, if they were real, which they're not, which breed in a small-scale controlled way, but mainly to avoid extinction rather than spread. But then you've got the fast breeders like zombies, if they existed, which they don't, where breeding is all they do. They are basically walking epidemics and are the worst of the worst case scenarios because such a creature could, hypothetically, wipe out civilization. This is humanity's greatest fear, which is why at the moment half of the world's horror novels, movie posters, and video games have zombies on the cover. So in any situation like this, step one is to find out what category of creature you're dealing with. Step two is to anticipate what the creature is going to do next, based on what you determined in step one. Then step three is you to find out if the thing can be killed with a chainsaw. This particular case was a fairly straightforward situation of a small creature taking over a man's head and controlling his body. That is a really specific thing for a creature to do, John thought, requiring countless specialized biological adaptations. So, it was unlikely that it was just some kind of Frankenstein-style genetic mistake with no goal beyond stumbling around biting people until somebody shot it enough times. So, Logically, that would mean it was a breeder, and that the taking over of a human body was done to facilitate breeding. What had John worried what had John worried was that the little shit looked like an insect, and in the normal course of things, insects are notoriously fast breeders, so it could be a worst case scenario. John suspected that somebody up the ladder had already arrived at that conclusion, which is why on this fine autumn afternoon you couldn't pull up to a stoplight and undisclosed without finding yourself in a Humvee sandwich. It's also presumably why the hospital had been roped off. So, how do we find Frankie? In John's estimation, that would come down to how much of Frankie's brain was still intact. His body was his still functioned despite the damage it had taken, so the basic nervous and muscular systems must still have been operated by his own human brain. So there surely had to be some remnant of Frankie's instincts and impulses in there. 
and Frankie was a cop. John could think of five shops in town that sold donuts, none of which said they had seen Frankie when John called. Where else did cops eat? John drove past a half dozen fast food franchises and didn't see Frankie inside when he passed. It was getting frustrating. Only two hours of light left now. Then John swung by Waffle House and found what he was looking for. Waffles. He was getting hungry by that point, and let's face it, it had been a eat-breakfast-for-dinner kind of day. Blueberry waffles, hash browns, washed down with a beer he found in his jacket. Around five, John dropped by Munch's trailer. Mitch Munch Lombard was one of the three bass players in John's band Three Arms Sally, and had been since high school. He was also a volunteer firefighter, which meant he had a police band scanner at his place. John figured he could stay on top of the manhunt and come up with a new plan. There were a bunch of dudes there already, and everybody was playing Guitar Hero and drinking that purple mix of 7-Up and cough syrup that sent John to the hospital last year. Steve Gaiman came in with a huge bag of frozen McNuggets he had stolen from the McDonald's where he worked. They fired up the fried daddy and ate McNuggets for an hour. There was a Japanese chick there who was either drunk or just really goofy. Either way, she could barely stand up and laughed at everything that happened. John took a hit as something that he realized gave him the ability to speak Japanese, or at least he thought it did. He made words that sounded like Japanese to the girl, and every time he did, she laughed so hard she almost pissed herself. He, had forgot he hadn't forgotten his mission. Occasionally, John would hear excited voices over the police scanner and would make everybody be quiet, but eventually everybody got so fucked up they wouldn't do it. Head Feingold and his girlfriend Jenny McCormick stopped by with a case of wine she won in a contest, and it was a party all of a sudden. A while later, Head went outside to puke and fell asleep on the deck. John found himself making out with a Chinese girl, but she started calling him a different name and he suddenly realized she had been confusing him with another guy all night. Do all white people look the same to Japanese? John got off the sofa and told her he had to use the bathroom, then quietly threw on his jacket and headed for the door. Dark outside. Damn it. John saw a head passed out on the deck under the grill. He turned around, went back into the trailer, grabbed a comforter and a pillow. He went back to the deck where Head lay and put the blanket over him and wedged the pillow under his head. Just as, just as he was about to leave again, John heard the scanner crackle to life behind him. The dispatcher was reporting that staff out at the turkey farm west of town were complaining that some vagrant was stealing turkeys. The responding cop said in the coded way cops do that they had bigger fish to fry. John, on the other hand, jumped off the deck and threw himself into his old Cadillac. He buckled his seatbelt, which he always did because he never knew when he would need to ramp something, he made the engine growl and told the headlights to fuck the night. John had inherited the old Cadillac from a great uncle who passed away the previous summer. There had been quite a heated debate among the family who would get stuck with the terrible car, as no one wanted to have to deal with the process of scrapping it. John volunteered and had been driving it ever since. Credence Clearwater Revival blasted from an old cassette as John bumped down the highway. He hated Credence, but Uncle Pat loved them, apparently. Or maybe that was just the t last tape he had been listening to when all the buttons on the ancient sound system stopped working. Either way, the tape was now in permanent play mode, playing through side A, reaching the end, automatically reversing and playing side B. Forever. As loud as it would go. You couldn't stop it. You couldn't eject it. Where there should have been a volume knob, there was only an empty hole, not even a little shaft that you could maybe grab with a pair of needle nose pliers. On each end of the caddy's dash were large lumps where John had wadded up towels and held them over the speakers with electrician's tape, hoping to muffle the sound. It did not. Credence was determined to be heard. John headed south down the highway, left onto a curb that transitioned to a rural paved road with no painted lines, and across the overpass. Then around the lake, heading toward a row of enormous low blue buildings. Turkey Factory. There was a gravel lane to the right, and John took it so hard he thought he was going up on two wheels. The caddy bumped and growled on the dirt road, rear end fishtailing like it was on ice, bits of gravel smacking the floorboards with a sound like popcorn. John scanned the grounds for any sign of Frankie. He wasn't feeling so good. The waffles and hash browns and beer and McNuggets and wine and the Japanese, girl, Japanese girl's chapstick sitting hard in his gut. Whomp. Oh, shit, shit. He had hit somebody. They were writhing on the hood as John's feet stomped around trying to find the brake pedal. A face was pressed against the windshield and it was, Frankie! Shit! John slammed on the brakes and the caddy spun out in the gravel. Frankie held on. John reached into his back seat for the chainsaw, then realized there was no chainsaw in the back seat because he had forgotten to drop by Dave's place to get it from his tool shed. Frankie reached around through the driver's side window and snatched at John's shirt. 
John shrugged away from the hand and dove for the opposite door, pushing his way out and rolling onto the ground. He ran, John's fists pumped toward the light of the turkey building, pulling frozen breaths around the cigarette butts piled up in his lungs. He heard footsteps behind him. John reached the building. There was the door. John yanked it open. The fucking smell. Holy shit. It was one of those stinks that seemed to generate its own warmth. Mold and poop and rotten meat. It hit him like a wall. It looked for a moment like there was a foot of snow inside the building, just white as far as the eye could see in that impossibly huge space. Turkeys. Turkeys so thick you couldn't see the ground. White feathers and thin little twitchy heads and here and there a rustle of flapping wings. Birds jumping and thrashing and squawking and flailing through the air, demonstrating turkey flight as one of God's failures. John was running again, kicking through turkeys, sucking in air, accidentally eating a feather, looking for a weapon. Where does a turkey farm keep the chainsaws? Thinking fast, John clutched at the nearest turkey, spun and hurled it at his pursuer. Frankie caught the bird like a flapping medicine ball, studied it, then turned and ran out of the building. God damn it, yelled someone from behind John. You gave him another turkey. You're paying for it. It was a couple of guys in gray coveralls. To the one who looked like he spoke English, John said, Weapons. We need weapons. That's the guy, Frankie. He'll be back after he eats that turkey. Get it, chain. Ah! A turkey bit him on the ankle. Wait, not a turkey. One of those fucking spider monsters. Shit! John kicked the spider off his shoe, hard enough that he expected it to go flying like a punted football, but it was kind of clinging to his shoe, and it only landed about ten feet away. One of the dudes in coveralls behind him started shouting something in Spanish. John turned to them and said, Kill it! Help me kill that thing! I think Frankie shit it! The dudes seemed to be running away. Hopefully they'd come back with a chainsaw. John backed up, realizing he'd kicked the spider to a spot where it had been between him and the door. More flapping and gobbling, the turkeys were going crazy where the spider had landed. John could see the spider appear to be attached to a turkey somehow. Then, one of the spider's legs shot out, becoming rigid and ten times as long. It impaled four turkeys as if on a skewer, punching through them with little sprays of blood and feather. The spider extended another tentacle and did it again. Four more turkeys skewered. Again. Now there were four rows of turkey joint turkeys jointed at the central point where the spider's body was. The egg-shaped cluster of turkeys rose as one body, as tall as a man. Two rows of turkeys forming legs, two forming arms. The turkey Voltron took tentative lumbering steps toward John. He couldn't help noticing that after a few steps, the two turkeys he was using his feet had been pulverized into a pink feathery mess. John stood frozen for several seconds while he tried to decide if any of this was happening was in fact happening. He decided that running was the best option either way. He ran across the building, spotting another door on the opposite wall, kicking turkeys as he went. He shoved through the door and, as if in answer to a prayer he had been too drunk and stoned to pray, there sat a filthy white pickup truck with a faded cartoon turkey on the door, the engine running. John threw himself into the driver's seat, grabbed the gear shift on the steering column, and realized it was the turn signal. He looked down to find the stick on the floor with a bundle of wings, feathers, and stench punched him in the face. He'd been hit in the jaw with a turkey fist. John slapped at the turkey, trying to shove it back out of the window, unsuccessfully. He found the crank to roll up the window, and the turkey gobbled frantically as it was squeezed by the glass. Behind it was the row of turkeys and the rest of the turkey man's body. John threw the truck in gear and stepped on the gas, hauling the thrashing body of possessed turkey alongside. Steering with his right hand and punching a confused fist turkey with his left, John smashed through a chain-link fence and plowed through a stack of bags of turkey feed. He cranked the wheel, nearly crashed right into the building he had just left, and found himself heading back toward the overpass, wind gushing through the gap in the window and filling the interior of the truck with feathers. The road curved, but John didn't, and suddenly he was bouncing over rough terrain, the turkey collectively exploding in angry gobbles with each bump. And then the terrain was gone. He was tilted in the air. Impact. The steering wheel punched him in the face. John heard a splash. He had time to think. Frankie is alive and Dave doesn't know it. Before everything went black.